You are in for a treat today. Paul had the privilege of speaking with John Moscow. He is retired now, but he was the deputy chief of the investigations division of the New York County District Attorney's Office. He is a legendary Manhattan assistant district attorney and has handled some of the biggest cases. Um, one of the cases they will talk about is the BCCI or the Bank of Credit and Commercial international case. This isn't a case I was familiar with, but it's pretty important and a pretty bang buster. I don't know, Paul, if you want to give us a little preview so we know what we're going to jump into and listen. Yeah. In the episode write up, uh, you can see that we kind of lay out some of the history. We link to this uh, Vanity Fair article that I asked John about. Um, so if you don't know the history, uh, do take a look at the article. It's a, it's a gangbusters article. A uh, great long read if you're into that type of stuff. If you've seen the movie The Infiltrator with um, Brian Cranston or American Made with um, uh, Tom Cruise, both of those, um, the, the Cranston movie, The Infiltrator, actually deals primarily with um, Robert Major. Cranston plays Major and, and BCCI. And, and uh, in American Made, uh, Cruise plays Barry Seal a TWA pilot turned many things, uh, helping the Medellin cartel, cartel uh, launder uh, drug money and um, through the bank of crooks and criminals, as it was called back then. Uh, this was a $23 billion bank. It had 70, it, was, it operated in 73 countries. It committed what was then a $10 billion crime. And John's uh, John's office with uh, Robert Morgenthau, the then district attorney, prosecuted it and ultimately led to its liquidation in the fall of in the summer of uh, 1991. We've got some pop culture references uh, throughout, um, one being uh, the granddaddy of them all. For those of you who don't pick up on it, Keith Jackson was a, a longtime sports broadcaster and it being the fall and the football season, uh, the granddaddy of them all in, the, in, in football is the Rose Bowl. And it really, um, we really do. And I really do think that if you look at the, the BCCI prosecution, um, I don't think you can get any, any worse um, from a from a criminal standpoint or, or better if you're in a, in a teaching standpoint. So we hope you enjoy this episode with John Moscow and BCCI 30 years later. By the time this airs, we will have passed uh, 9-11's 20th anniversary. And there's a lot of you know, discussion about um, the event and, and things of that nature. I actually wanted to talk about this is a course in a course. This is a podcast in uh, money laundering, technology, and the law. And to bring it into the fall, and 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 Keith Jackson, we have the the granddaddy of them all. We've got the um, the BCCI case. And firstly, you know, was this? And I, I've I've researched this, and you know, I, I was at the DA's office for a very brief short period of time, uh, well after this, but. I've read the de I've read the the background on it, and was this and does this remain the granddaddy of them all? If I say yes, I just want to explain. Well, it's your opinion. That's the name of this. Yeah, baby. <laughs> it, was, it was the granddaddy of them all in the sense that it involved international money laundering on huge scale with governments all around corruption all around, any sort of crime that people wanted to engage in was fine with the bankers so long as they got their money. And being the granddaddy doesn't mean you're the biggest, doesn't mean you're the best. You were the one, that was the one which came public as the first major international money laundering scandal. It wasn't just narcotics. It wasn't just this or that. It was, we're in the business of laundering money. What blew me away was when I read about it wasn't just anti-money laundering and fraud. There was a total unsafe and soundness to this. There was no capital. There was no liquidity. There were no real loans, no real deposits. This was, this was a bank in, in, in name only. And the Vanity Fair article and and 
this the the podcast episode does have a link to the to the article. It, it said, you know, these are the guys how they broke the bank. Like it wasn't a bank. You guys didn't break anything. <laughs> it was a bank in the sense that it was treated as a bank. It was respected as a bank. It was fear as a bank. It had all of the liabilities of a bank and defects. It just didn't have the assets. Well, you didn't break it then because it was already broken. Well, okay. We, we got the Bank of England and others to acknowledge the fact that it had to be closed. Yeah. That's what we got. Um, the, 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 the brazenness, the, the total lack of the cooperation, the, the private and the public sector uh, kind of be running up against the DA's office, the Manhattan DA's office, Mr. Morgan, are you, uh, Michael Tricaski, all running up against private and public sector. For for me, as a, as a as a teacher of this, it's it just is. You can't get any worse or slash better if you look at it from a teaching perspective of just how how awful it really can become. Yes, it was. I'll say it before and I'll say it again. They there was a bank. There was a full service bank and they would do anything their customers wanted. And anything does not mean anything limited by the customs of a particular society. It doesn't mean anything within the limits of your imagination. It's within the limits of the imagination of whoever asks for it. And that gets to be very serious because anything is a very, very, very big word. And when you have people around the globe who will do anything without asking questions, except that their customers want it, fine, we'll do it. When I, that's a problem. When I think it was 10 years ago, near 10 years ago, that for me and my generation of practitioners, you know, the HSBC case and that $2 billion fine that kind of set compliance and money laundering, I think because of media, like when I was, Kind of going through it, I've used that as a as a as a test case to explain how uh, how compliance or how uh, uh, programs go wrong. If you Google uh, back then HSBC, all I did was Google image HSBC. It came up with uh, the money laundering bank. You know, is this? You know, there were all these different cartoons and 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 images. When the BCCI case was going through, I guess the late 80s, and even with the 91 or 92, 91, I think settlement or, or prosecution, they actually they didn't settle. They they you, they, you, they, they, they pled, and they closed. What was there as much media within the United States around it and the the ramifications coming off of it as we saw with say uh, you know HSBC? No. Uh, I, when we were going to announce the indictment. Uh, Morgenthau and I were discussing what the press reaction would be. And I thought that it would be fairly substantial. I thought there might be as many as three TV cameras. We thought that that might be too many, but normally press conferences were held in his office. And you, would, you would have press. If there were TV cameras, you'd have them, you'd have the reporters, whatever. <sighs> we got that one wrong. <laughs> and? The American reaction was not all that important. The European and Asian reaction, we had something on the order of 25 TV cameras and 75 reporters. And we did not have something like the space. <laughs> we had to take the chairs out so that if you see pictures of it, you'll see Morgenthau sitting behind the table and he's directly next to the wall. And people are standing to his side and behind him, but there are no chairs because there isn't room for chairs. It was. But I saw it. The reaction outside the United States was immense. I'm going to ask you about another photo in, in later on, but um, as when a difference I saw in in looking at the BCCI case versus the HSBC case, the HSBC case, and I, I watched that the, and and used those those nine hours of testimony, and we also make those you know available to listeners is. Look, you had people raising alarms. Uh, I asked you something in the preview, and you and you were very kind to me when I when I raised. You know, did a SAR ever help you guys with this? And and you were like, "What's what's what's a SAR? That didn't that didn't come about." 
you know, with the BCCI, you had, uh, you know, that guy, Jack Blum come up and kind of drop this on you, this McGilla that you had to, I guess, piece through over, I guess, a two year period of time. But at least with the HSBC case, we had people raising alarms. And so as we've progressed out of the, 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 the total brazenness, the, you know, what BCCI uh, was, have we, have you seen, what are some bright lights that you've seen? And we talked about some challenges that AML and financial crimes fighters, whether in the public or private sector, what positives have you seen? And as a preview, I'm going to ask the reverse, the uh, it's inverse in a few minutes. Well, let me just, I'm probably not going to respond to either question, but the different HSBC was populated by bankers. BCCI was populated by people earning a living and doing what they were told. HSBC would engage in transactions. They advertised throughout the airports of the world, the world's local bank, which is very nice, but there is, in fact, a difference in responsibility for a global bank than for a local bank. And the global bank is supposed to know what it's doing and where the money is coming from and where it's going to. Not complicated, but they're supposed to know that. And they're also supposed to know that if it isn't allowed to go there, they're running it. If, if Iran is sending money to the United States to get transactions done in dollars, concealing the fact that it's Iranian is not a good idea. And HSBC did that routinely. I mean, the permanent subcommittee came up with a marvelous report out of Angola where you had a lot of money coming into Angola, going up to London, from London to New York. Well, when it went from London to New York, New York rated at low risk. London had no problems with Angola. New York had a lot of problems with Iran. But Angola just didn't bother to keep track of that stuff. And once they start clipping the swift messages and concealing where it's coming from, that's where all the banks got in big trouble. Do I have it right? And and I know that loophole had been closed, uh, the, the U-turn transactions. Yes. Did, what, didn't they have that as an allowance and they didn't even use the U-turn allowance? They, they completely obfuscated that and there they ran afoul or am I some, being simplistic? I don't know the details well enough to answer that. Yeah. They had, there was a U-turn thing initially and then they said, nope, can't do it. We want to cut off Iran altogether. And people said, well, we aren't going to do that. We'll conceal that it's Iran. If we aren't allowed to send messages through New York saying it's Iranian money, we'll send messages through New York saying something else. But it'll still be the same Iranian money. Yeah. And one of my partners here was the guy in the DA's office, Adam Kalki, who prosecuted those cases. And yeah. And, uh, and you know, it's public. I mean, Exeger is a, uh, was created by Michael Cherkasky. He's, he was with you back in, you know, the, the late yeah. 80s and 90s. He was doing a very important case domestically. When I was doing BCCI, he was doing the case that broke the, gar- the mobs control of the garbage industry. And it was immense. But then he went off in the private sphere and then he became the Counsel to the, uh, or maybe he was the monitor for HSBC. Exeter is founded on that. Yeah. And they, they did some incredibly good work, some of which we still have to keep quiet. They yeah. Did very good uh, work. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't poke and prod there. I, I, I know them. I know their I reputation. Know. I know a bunch of, you know, it's a, it's a good place where alums from uh, the DA's office have gone. We'll, we'll stop there. Um, all right, so you weren't going to take the bite, the bait on the on the first question about you know what's what's been going you know right in 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 anti money laundering. Um, I'll ask you. You can punt again. And by the way, you did punt. Uh, what's going wrong? Because th- I don't think that's a that's a tough one. Look, what's going right and what's going wrong is much the same. What's going is we're getting increasingly demanding controls, increasingly 
expensive controls. It's not clear to me that the bank regulators and the prosecutors aren't playing games of piling on when somebody's down, which is not necessarily the way to go. So you, you, know, you have the SEC going after companies because their anti-money laundering controls aren't adequate. Okay, maybe, but what you're trying to do is to make sure that there is an accurate record of where money goes and who's sending it and who's getting it. And we are spending a lot of money and keeping a lot of people employed, coming up with processes, but not that much in looking at the transactions and saying what happens here. When I was doing BCCI, I saw that there was there were transactions between Egypt, BCCI Egypt, and the branch in the Bahamas. And they were doing massive trades, the tune of about a billion and a half dollars in 1990. Well, I'm sorry, Egypt and the Bahamas? What, the Egyptian sand is different in quality and you have to exchange it? What are you talking about? There was no trade finance to be done between those two countries in that amount of money. But somebody had to look and ask. And, you know, that, I don't know that we have, and I'm not sure that we can afford to have adequate personnel looking at each of these transactions. People have to be intelligent, they have to be well trained, they have to know the economics of each industry in each country in the world. That's brutal. In terms of costs, forgetting the dollars, that's a lot of human talent you're spending just to know what's happening. The, the, the statistician Nate Silver wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Signal and Noise, and that he didn't coin it. But yeah. the, you know, here, here are the noises, the, 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 the millions, the trillions of transactions that are, that are benign and, and finding the signal, and I've said this on other episodes, it's just, it, it's, it's almost comically difficult. And doing it just alone with the with the with the humans is 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 difficult, and you know we have AML technology in the law, uh, you know, tagged to this podcast because I think it's 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 completely Im- impossible without technology. But let's talk about the humans. Are, are are we doing too much in the in the private sector? Should we be asking the the public sector, the government, whether it's state or federal or both? to take more of these controls, albeit at a cost. And I'll kind of leave it at the cost no, and a question mark. Not a chance. The question for each institution should be, what is this transaction? Should we do it? And they're the only ones who can really answer that. Right? There's no way the government can keep, maybe they can hire initially, but they can't keep employed people with enough sophistication for that. For example, there is a, I I may have told you, I got a question one time from the Fed. They wanted to know what the hell was going on with Park Avenue Bank, which had received something like $450 million in the 90s, there was no way that the Park Avenue Bank should be getting that. Like, what are you talking about, guys? And it took about two years. We found out what it was. It was absolutely legal, but the bankers were correct in saying what the hell is going on here. It was a very large, very successful family which decided that Latin America was too risky and they were moving all their assets out. But you need to be able to answer that question, right? If it's Escobar, rather than the family that it was, you want to know it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. What about a public utility that was uh, basically the rails across all the financial trans? Almost like a if you ran everything across Swift, and I know Swift is only one type of transaction. But what if everything went through a public utility, and that public utility was then tasked with 
monitoring and, and connecting the dots. And it's connecting the dots is that that's the biggest problem. Does that scare the hell out of you from a, a from a civil liberty standpoint? You bet. It should. Is it viable? Let's start off. Swift has enough problems making sure that it's 100% accurate. They have the highest standards of anybody around because they cannot afford to screw up. Not that they don't, but they can't afford to. They really have to be correct. And to say not only do you have to make sure that all the instructions are accurate and followed and so on, but that the information you're given about the initial beneficiary and the ultimate initial transmitter and the ultimate beneficiary is correct, that's beyond them. It's a totally different skill set. Right? If, if the banks which make up SWIFT are going to put false information in, all SWIFT can do is accurately transmit the information according to the money according to the information. Right. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Right? That's it. For money laundering purposes, that's it. For money transmission purposes, it has to be right. The, I remember the, somebody saying, how could you possibly miss $7 million at the Bank of New York in 1998? Yeah. It was a $7 million transaction. And I looked at it and said, well, um, how much money do you think they move a day? At that point, they were settling $600 million. No. Six hundred billion dollars a day. Yeah. By that, by twenty-four, and that's a lot of billions of dollars per hour. As you've seen, the um, I would like to. I work at a bank, and we we work feverishly to try and keep our technologies, our our, our people, you know, up up to date and up to speed. I, I think that we've we we collectively over the past twenty thirty years have gotten better, although the 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 money launderer has gotten much better as well. Are there some, I asked you this in the pre, how would you, how would you launder money? And cause I, I think it's crazy to try and go straight into a bank and do it. I'd do it, you know, in other channels, but um, what would you do? I'm not going to answer that. I think that's a fair, I think, given, given your, your stature, I think that's a good answer. Um, the, the, the things that have always struck me in, in movies is almost how simplistic they make it they make it look uh, albeit you know in the in the 80s I don't think that we were terribly fit for purpose to to, to find these but where where we are now in you know 2021 looking at 2022 if if you and um, and I know mr mr Morgenthau for those who uh, aren't aware passed away in July of 2019 just shy of his uh, 100th birthday. But if you and, and Mr. Morgenthau and Michael Tricaski got the band back together now and you were in um, ADA's office, what would you be doing? In terms of prosecuting money laundering? Yeah. I mean, if you look at where, where we are, I mean, there is a little bit of sadly rinse and repeat in the, in the prosecutions, in the enforcement actions. Um, is there anything that you'd be doing differently? I don't know that I'm in a position to answer that because it's you're asking me to prioritize what investigations you would do first and so on, where I really don't know what the current state of play is in terms of the um, activities involved. Okay, we still have narcotics money laundering. We still have tax frauds of all sorts. But I don't know what a public prosecutor's highest priority in terms of money laundering should be, except that we do have a statute, federal statute, which makes money laundering a crime. And that it's written so that if you steal money, you put it in the bank, and then you take it out, you launder it, you take it out. Technically, that is money laundering, but that's not the that's not the socially dangerous part of money laundering. When when um, 
one of the things that drew me, I, I grew up in Maryland, but drew me to applying to the Manhattan DA's office was, you know, even though it was a county prosecutor, you know, what Mr. Morgenthau had said, and this, I knew this when I was actually applying was, you know, the, the root cause of the, the, the engine for, for, for drug deals, for, um, you know, street crime tends to start at the banks. And so this is the, the white collar root cause. And so even though I'm a county, pro I'm, I'm paraphrasing, well, even though I'm a county prosecutor, I'm going after the, you know, the, the belly of the beast, the root cause of these issues in order, and, and it's happening on my turf with, with, the, with the banks. No, that's the point. All of the major economic crimes, the proceeds are going to be going through Manhattan. Not all, but a huge chunk, more than enough to keep Manhattan busy. Yeah. Uh, and that's, quite important. But, you know, suppose we have, take a random example, customs fraud, where we are exporting dual purpose items from the United States to countries where the end user certificate says it's going to be used <clears throat> for lawful purposes. And the end user certificate is phony, and the money, the Transactions may take place in Finland or Estonia or Latvia. They go into Russia and maybe then to Iran to the, the equipment goes to help build centrifuges, that kind of stuff. That's big money. You, you know what scares me about that is, um, and I just read recently, you know, just outside of the major ports in California, and you can probably take it to many other ports, all of the the carrier ships, the transportation ships are backed up. It would be the way they wrote it, which scared me was there. If, if there was one ship outside of port as a delay over 24 hours, that would be weird. And there are s somewhere around 20 to 40 outside. And so this glut. And so I get cern concerned is when they're coming into port, is it then just a fast track to move through customs? And so there are controls in place in order to look at the, the the wares coming through and the container ships and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is there are there controls going to be relaxed? And I think that there is right now probably within the past twenty to thirty within the past twenty years. I'm going to use post nine eleven because I think we we have been better in trade finance um, and 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 shipping uh, controls. But I think. The inherent risk is is sky high with something slipping through um, uh, from abroad. Of course, absolutely. I mean, I don't know that the customs inspection of what you're thinking ever takes place, but that's that's a separate issue. The export to countries we think we've blocked of electronics that we don't want them to have is a very substantial and thriving industry. And that would be an area where you go for money, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just do you do you think a BCCI could occur today? I don't know what modifications would be necessary, but we have an awful lot of people who don't really verify details. And that's sort of important. So I, I can't say that it would occur, but something could afford that large occur, sure. I'm reading a book now about the fire festival. You hear of it? Sure. Well, they had nothing. They just they raised money and gave it to influencers and got huge public interest and raised lots more money. What they forgot to do was get a venue, get the entertainers. <laughs> yeah. Could you do it? They did it. And nobody um, Theranos is on trial. Um, um, what's her name yes. out? She's out in trial. So yeah, you're, uh, yeah, no, I get it. They're, they're the, they're the, the, the whole the work. What did you, I think you had, I actually have some quotes from the, uh, what did you say? And this is from the set 92 article, the case study. This is a case study in the power of drug and oil money. 
And I think whether it's the power of drug and oil money or the power of X or Y money, I think it's the power of money that uh, the, the power of power. And I think the power of money are a, uh, a, a nuclear combination. When Morgenthau was the DA in Manhattan, he was elected by the electors of New York County, and he could not be removed except by the governor for good cause shown after a hearing. And the governor and he were never in that position. So he was there. There was nothing anybody could do about it. When we were doing BCCI, the government of the United Arab Emirates, got in touch with the U.S. State Department and asked them, would you please tell this local prosecutor to stop making a mess of this thing? They're interfering with this bank. And when we got a hold of those communications, after the bank had been closed and we had made peace with the United Arab Emirates and so on, we had a great deal of fun saying, gee, I wonder who at the State Department got the assignment of calling the boss and telling him to lay off the case. <laughs> and we were just laughing because there was nobody in the country who could do it. Okay, so so all right, so there were no SARS. The subpoena power, you guys were issuing subpoenas that were largely toothless. The they were almost like Midwestern facades that the the targets were ignoring, um, if not pushing over, pushing through. And that um, you guys had to go to England. Mr. Morgenthau, I had read, uh, went to England to have conversations with the Bank of England. That uh, Rick Small, when he was with the Federal Reserve, went to uh, Abu Dhabi. Morgenthau did not go to England. He came to Morgenthau. Okay. When, when Eddie George and Brian Quinn came right. to office, that was, I, he wasn't traveling. I stand corrected. It was interesting, but no. He, he he didn't like the trap. Yeah, that's real clear. He was willing to get on a sailboat, but he didn't just didn't particularly like the trap. Right. All right. So I'm going to bring up that photo that I was talking about in the Vanity Fair article. Mr. Morgenthau's in the middle. Tricaski's to his left. You're to his right. The, Alan the looks behind the, him. Nikki Kowalski is to Alan's right. And you, is to her right. It happens to be on the wall above me. Oh, it does? Take a look at your face, because I'm going to see if I can put this. You're, and then Harry Benson took the photo from uh, from Vanity Fair, the articles by Marie uh, uh, Brenner, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, that's posed. But what did they tell you to look like that? You're looking over your shoulder, and it just cracks me up, because Cherkaski and Mr. Morgan have the same exact kind of look. You don't. You're looking at it? Oh, yeah. I'm so happy you got look it. Over, look over Mike's left shoulder. Yep. You see Richard Price. Yes. You know, he was bald in German. We called him Herr Price. <laughs> he was not amused either. What Benson did was he said, this will only take two minutes. And 25 minutes later, he was saying, just one more. Just, and he got everybody totally pissed off which was his intention. And that was when we were all sufficiently enraged, he then took the picture. Love it. I love it. Well, I mean, he, he did it. And when I saw it, and I think when I went to interview, I saw it somewhere, but I think when I went to interview in the Dece December of 2000, I, it, that, that was somewhere. Cause I remember seeing it and be like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to my third interview or fourth interview. I think at that time. But, um, Look, I, 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 to, 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 to wrap up, you know, it is, we are 30 years uh, after BCCI. Um, we're 20 years after 9 11. We're, you know, for better or worse, we're, we're trying to pass these new uh, acts. The AML Act of 20 came out. Uh, you are seeing these technologies, which you and I talked about in the preview, trying to, you know, make it better. Um, do, do you see a point in time where, we will be more effective at combating these financial crimes, at least within the financial, within at least within the financial services space. No. Look, 
the the point which I was making in ninety one and since the the ability to use money anonymously is the ability to exert power anonymously. And if you are so tempted, you can hire hitmen. You can arrange for someone to get promoted. You can arrange for someone to get a job. You can do whatever you want anonymously. And if it's anonymous, it's irresponsible. And people who are committing crimes want that anonymity. What we can do is we can make some things more transparent. So that if you look at them afterwards, you can trace what happened. But there are still ways in which you set up a corporation in Minsk. Um, it operates for a few months. It closes. The Russians don't seem to have any legal requirement that you maintain the books and records of a closed business. So what it did? Gone. And you do that four times in a year, and bingo, you have no clue what happened in the past. And that sort of thing can be found by anybody sufficiently interested in getting anonymity for financial transactions. It doesn't mean that everything's not traceable. It just means it's, it can be done, and there isn't a whole lot that we can sell. Any any positive or uh, negative or maybe you know uh, neutral thoughts on what's going on with uh, the various cryptocurrencies and their their traceability? I don't think I am well enough versed in that to give a useful opinion. Now I've seen people trace Bitcoin transactions. It was initially supposed to be untraceable. But the problem is that the amounts, when you have enough decimal points, the amounts are sufficiently identifiable that you may not know who's doing it, but you can trace one, one amount to another from point A to point B. Um, big data computers may break all of that, may break the privacy of all of that. I don't mean that they'll stop the user. I just don't know. I'm not really in a position to opine on that. What I do know is that we are setting up a whole new financial system where history teaches us that every time we do, the fraudsters get in there first and there's a major scandal that goes up before they sort out the bugs. And we haven't had that yet, so I anticipate we will. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to keep trying to uh, my 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 co-host uh, Zila Costa Grimes. She wasn't able to join us, but we're, what we're trying to do with this podcast is is uh, raise awareness, raise uh, additional potential solutions. We've we've had discussions with um, uh, companies who do uh, information sharing in a in a very unique way through uh, homomorphic uh, encryption. Where you're able to hopefully get some more private privacy controls, but I, I do think, and I agree with you that right now we're you know the the jury's out talking to one of, one of my idle lawyers. The jury's out, but uh, John, I really want to thank you for coming on. I I, uh, I very much appreciate it. These are um, these are serious topics that have led to um, serious consequences and. Uh, I appreciate you spending the time with me and, and, and really speaking your mind about this. So thank you very much. Take care. All right. This has been a production of Opinions My Own. I'm Zila Acosta Grimes, and with Paul Caulfield, we are your hosts, bringing you episodes breaking down the state and future of anti money laundering, technology, and the law. Thank you to Fordham Law School and our production assistant, Ava Lichter, for their support. If you have suggestions, questions, or would like to be on the podcast, please email us at opinionsmyownpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter at mine underscore podcast and YouTube at opinionsmyown. Thank you for listening.